Welcome back. This is part two of my video about managing trees for self-sufficiency. Um, I went inside, had some lunch, warmed up and came back out with some nice thick gloves on, ready to do some work. So the first thing I want to do is introduce you to this, which is probably the most expensive tool that I've bought since moving here two and a half years ago. I'm not really one for gadgets, for techie things. In fact, I tend to prefer doing things the traditional way um, as much as I possibly can. But there really isn't a traditional way, um, even an inefficient traditional way, to do what this thing can do. And it's become incredibly useful to me. It's invaluable to me, um, almost as invaluable as you are, um, since I, I got it six months ago. Um, and I'm going to give you a demonstration of, of how it works, what it is. I'm sure you've probably figured it out by now. It's, it's not difficult. But um, before I do that, um, I want to first kind of go over what you get when you coppice a hedgerow tree, or any tree in fact, uh, if I can stay up and not knocked over by this guy. So let's look at what you get when you coppice a tree, um, as we did in the last video. So the first thing you get when you coppice a tree is a load of logs like this pile here. I have um, several piles like this dotted around where I've been coppicing this winter. Um, and I tend to cut my logs about uh, a foot long, 30 centimetres, something like that, which makes them a good size for fitting in my wood burning stove. Um, you'll be amazed how long a pile of hardwood logs like this will last. This, these are from um, a mixture of blackthorn and hawthorn, which burn really slowly and release a lot of heat. So they're really efficient as a, as a way of generating heat. Um, especially if you have a rocket mass stove, which I don't have yet, but I'm intending to make one um, at some point in the future. And rocket mass stoves, um, if you don't know about them, they basically recycle the smoke produced by burning wood and reburn that smoke, producing ever more heat and all but eliminating the, the fumes that the smoke that's produced from um, burning wood. So th there's almost no emissions from a rocket mass stove and almost 100% of the energy stored in, in the wood is turned into heat. So incredibly efficient, great from the, for the environment. Um, if you're interested and you get the opportunity to make one, do some research on YouTube, they're incredible things. Um, but anyway, back to the logs. Obviously you can't burn them like this, so you need to do something with them. Let's talk about that next. So the first thing you need to do is split the logs. Um, splitting logs like this will increase the surface area, um, which means they'll burn much easier. Um, if you don't split logs, they take longer to dry, to season. Um, and the burning process is much um, less efficient. So particularly with dense hardwoods like this, you need to split them. And the next thing you need to do is season them. Seasoning just means leaving them to dry. Um, and you can see behind me, this is one of my little outbuildings um, on my land. Um, I've got a huge pile of... Um, moss is just disrupting that pile. Um, a huge pile of logs which um, I split the previous winter from, I think, the winter of 2017-18. Um, so these have been drying for one year now. Um, but you need to season logs like this, at least in this climate, for two years. You can't really burn them um, for two years. There are some trees like ash that will burn green, so unseasoned. But most species of tree, um, if you try and burn them without seasoning the wood, then it'll just hiss and spit or the fire will die out entirely. So seasoning is an essential step. And you need to store them in a, a fairly cool, well-ventilated place. This little outbuilding has a, a gap at the back there where the air can flow through and at the other side. Um, so it's, it needs to be well-ventilated um, and give them at least two years to fully dry out before you burn them. So here I am in another one of my outbuildings. This is my wood store, appropriately named as it's full of another stash of wood. Um, split logs from 2016 and 17. So this was the first winter that I was here um, from 
trees that I coppiced um, right at the beginning. And this wood is all bone dry now. It's fully seasoned um, and it burns extremely hot. Um, and I still have quite a plentiful supply. As you can see, these bags are, are overflowing. I think this stash alone will last me another several years. Um, but I want to briefly talk about why I believe it's such a good thing to burn wood from your own trees in terms of the environmental impact. Um, first of all, it um, has zero oil associated with transportation. If you have to drive somewhere to buy something, to drive it back, to burn it, then you're consuming oil, a finite resource. Um, and if you can avoid doing that, then that's got to be a good thing. Um, and obviously it's even worse if you have trucks driving around with, with delivering oil for your central heating system. Natural gas isn't great as well in terms of transportation. Something on your own land that you can supply yourself with um, through a bit of hard work and, and, and graft outside, which is, let's face it, great fun, I believe, then that's got to be a, um, a good thing for the environment. And the other point, the most important one, is that it's carbon neutral. And I've read a few comments disputing this, but I want to present my, my argument for why this is carbon neutral. Um, during the lifespan of a tree, it's constantly absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and depositing it um, in the xylem, the uh, vascular tissue within the wood. So what you're burning effectively is that carbon, which then is being released into the atmosphere. But um, what you're releasing is what that tree locked up in the course of its life. Um, so as long as you are um, allowing that tree to regrow, either through coppicing it and then letting the shoots regrow, or planting new trees, which is another thing that I, I've done a lot of here, then those trees, that new growth, will lock up more carbon. Um, so as long as you manage the process and you're not just constantly cutting more trees down, then it is a carbon neutral way to heat your home. And there are very, very few sources of heat that are carbon neutral. Um, if you burn oil, natural gas, peat, coal, none of those things are remotely carbon neutral and they're terribly damaging to the environment. Burning your own wood in a managed way, in a sustainable way is. So in that sense, it's fantastic. And the third point in terms of uh, burning your own logs is it's free. It's a resource from your own land which you can manage and control yourself. Free is the magic word when it comes to self-sufficiency, so that's got to be another good thing. So one final quick point before I go out and brave the cold again. Um, I want to talk briefly about this stuff, peat. And this little chunk I took from this very outbuilding, it was obviously stored here um, in ye olde times and used to heat the, the cottage. Um, but peat really doesn't stack up when it comes to um, being environmental or environmentally conscious because this stuff takes thousands of years to form. It's actually um, compressed organic matter plants that are um, formed in waterlogged bogs where um, in order to harvest it farmers have to come in and drain the bogs um, by digging out big channels and in doing so you know more peat can't be formed. It's, it's stopping that process of regeneration with a tree, if you cut a tree down, you can plant another tree or you can coppice it and allow it to regrow. There's no comparable um, process for peat. Um, you can't make new peat bogs. So it's a, it is a finite resource. And I've read um, a few times now that it's actually worse environmentally. It has a bigger carbon footprint than burning coal, which really is saying a lot. It's pretty disastrous for the environment. So as much as you like the smell of burning peat, if you're one of the people that likes to um, use it to heat your home, from an environmental standpoint, you're much, much, much better off burning wood. So back to coppicing. Um, the other thing that you're left with, of course, after you've coppiced a tree, is great piles of these things, branches, um, or sallies, as all my Irish farmer neighbors seem to call them. Um, and if anyone knows why branches are called sallies in Ireland, then please let me know in the comments because I'd love to know. Um, but obviously these are too small really to bother with for firewood um, and they're difficult to process. Um, I do tend to take some bits for kindling, but um, you get huge quantities of branches when you coppice a tree. So 
what can you do with them? Well, when I first moved here, I made a huge mistake, probably the biggest mistake I've made since coming here. Um, and that's that I piled great masses of these branches up in mounds and I covered them with um, organic matter, things like grass cuttings and waste from my vegetables. And I thought that by just leaving them there, they would decompose and turn into lovely, usable, rich compost. Um, and if I'd left them there for 50 years, maybe 30, they certainly would, I'm, I'm sure of it. But the problem with doing that is it's just too slow. Um, branches like this will literally take decades to rot, um, certainly to become something usable. Um, of course, you can make hugel mounds. Anyone familiar with permaculture will, will know about hugel mounds. But, you know, I didn't want hugel mounds all over my land and I had lots of branches. Um, and I ended up deconstructing all these great piles of logs and branches that I'd made. Um, and with the help of volunteers, pulling out all these branches um, and doing something entirely different with them because the process of decomposition was just too slow. So that takes us right back to the beginning and um, this thing, which is a wood chipper. Um, now it's an electric chipper. You can get uh, petrol powered wood chippers, which are much bigger and more expensive and heavier, harder to maneuver. This thing's fantastic. It's on little wheels. I can push it around. Um, and it's a turbine chipper, which means it's the type that is engineered to be really efficient at um, chipping branches or sallies, as I should call them now, um, rather than tearing up leaves. You can get the type that are really good for, for, for kind of leafy green um, organic matter. But this one is the type that's great with, with branches. So I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why wood chips are such an amazing resource for self-sufficiency. And this is what you're left with at the end of it. So it's a couple of days later. I had to wait for the snow to melt to reveal this to you, which, um, as you can see, is a huge pile of, of wood chips. Um, and I chipped these from branches, just like the ones you saw um, earlier, um, about three months ago. So it was back in November. And you can already see or maybe you can't on this camera actually, but I can already see that they're beginning to break down. Um, and that's one of the wonders of, of wood chips. Because you're exposing more surface area, the decomposition process is much, much quicker than if you just left a branch lying on the ground. Um, so these are already going soft. Um, the moisture's getting into them and the bacteria is beginning to act on them and break them down. Um, and that's important because wood chips are absolutely vital if you want to make compost. And anyone who's looked at YouTube videos or read about making compost will know that you should have ideally two parts brown matter, which is basically wood chips or maybe cardboard, um, for every one part green matter, which is things like um, bits of vegetables that are left over, uh, grass cuttings, hedge trimmings maybe. Um, so you need a lot of wood chips if you're going to make good compost. Um, what these provide is aeration. They allow oxygen to penetrate into the compost heap. So if you just make a huge pile of grass cuttings or a huge pile of um, hedge trimmings, then what will happen is it'll just turn into a kind of slimy sludge. It won't compost properly. 
Whereas if you mix in layers of wood chips, you'll find that the compost um, breaks down and becomes soil, which is of course what you want. So these things are absolutely vital for adding fertility back into your soil. You're turning branches from trees that you're coppicing back into fertility that you can direct wherever it's needed on your piece of land. Um, but that's not where the wonder of wood chips ends. There's more. So here we are in my strawberry growing empire, as I remember calling it back in that first video I made in uh, May last year. Um, and the strawberry plants are all doing really well. Um, but one thing you'll notice that's different is that they're now all surrounded by wood chips. And that's because I use wood chips as a mulch. They make a fantastic mulch. Um, and mulching is really when you just take something like wood chips um, or seaweed if you happen to live near a beach um, or even compost if you've got enough of it to spare. Um, but I think compost really is best used for kind of um, directed fertility when you're planting things out and you want a, a big hit of, of uh, nutrients in one area. Um, but wood chips are perfect for mulching. And then you spread that around your growing plants on the surface of the soil. You don't dig it in, so it's very um, low energy input. It's very low work. It doesn't require too much effort. Um, and you let nature do the work for you in the form of bacteria, which will break it down, and worms, which will um, digest it and transport it under the surface of the soil, where it will be released um, as nutrients, which can um, then release fertility, and that's the first major advantage of mulching. You're adding fertility back into the soil. Um, and if you have sandy soils in particular, then they tend to be very low in nutrients. So um, mulching with wood chips is going to add your, your nitrogen, your um, phosphate, your potassium back into that soil, as well as lots of other minor nutrients, um, with very little um, energy on your part involved in doing that. Um, the second big advantage is that um, if you've got clay soils, like I have, um, now clay holds nutrients really well, so you probably don't have deficiencies in, in nutrients if you've got clay soil, but clay soil is really dense and it's hard for particularly young plants to root down into it, so adding um, a mulch of wood chips will improve the structure of that soil because as the worms break it down, digest it, and carry it under the surface, um, the organic matter is, is much bigger particles, which is bringing oxygen, it's aerating the soil, um, which is making it much easier for young plant seedlings to root down into that soil. Um, another big advantage is that it stops um, nutrients leaching into the atmosphere. And you'll hear gardeners talking about this all the time if you um, watch gardening programs or read gardening books about how you should never have bare exposed soil because just um, leaving soil um, exposed to the sun and atmosphere causes a huge loss of nitrogen. And it's true as far as I'm aware. Um, mulching of course prevents that because it's covering the soil up. There are other things you can do. You can cover it in tarps, something else I've done in the past. Um, you can plant green manure over the winter and then dig that in in the spring. There are quite a few different techniques, but the easiest thing to do really is just to make a load of wood chips like this from your branches and just spread them over the surface of any bare soil to prevent loss of nutrients. Um, another advantage, there's yet more, is that um, wood chips as a mulch will hold moisture. So if you have, live in a, in a hot climate that's prone to dry periods, to droughts, then um, mulching with something like wood chips will hold that surface layer of water. It won't cause flooding, it'll do the opposite in fact, um, but it'll keep moisture there which can then be released slowly into the ground um, as it's needed. So um, there are so many advantages to these things as a mulch. Um, another one I think is that they look really pretty, you know, much better than um, just bare soil at least. I'd much rather have wood chips spread over my ground. <laughs> And one final advantage of uh, mulching with wood chips, which I forgot to mention in that last part, is that they act as a weed suppressant. So um, this area here, I've planted lots of fruit trees and bushes, which I'm hopefully gonna make a video about at some point. Um, and I've covered the ground with wood chips as a mulch. 
Now it won't stop every weed from growing up. I'm sure lots of the grass will still come up, but it'll certainly suppress those weeds. It'll hold them back while the things that you've planted have a chance to become established. And it doesn't end there. There's yet another fantastic use for wood chips, and that's as bedding material for your animals. Um, I use them in my chicken coop as an alternative to wood shavings. Of course, wood shavings, um, which I was using previously, you have to buy, so they're an expense. You have to drive somewhere, drive back with them. Great big heavy bag that you're heaving around. Um, much better to produce something yourself directly. Um, I let mine dry for a bit, so I have a, um, a bag, a ton bag in one of my outbuildings, and I fill that up with wood chips, let them dry for a few months, um, and at that point they're perfect for the chicken coop. Um, I'm sure they'd be just as comfortable for, for ducks, for um, pigs, even for cattle. My um, farmer neighbor kind of has eyed my pile of wood chips from over the fence, um, enviously talking about how they'd make really great bedding for his, um, his calves over the winter. So um, perfect as bedding material. And in the case of my chicken coop, of course, um, when I clean it out, what I take out is a load of broken down wood chips covered in chicken poop. And what could be better for the compost heap than that, let's face it. One final quick point on the subject of chickens and wood chippers is this, and anyone who's grown vegetables um, will know exactly what this is. It's the stump that you're left with when you've harvested all your um, broccoli or Brussels sprouts or um, cabbages or I think this is a stump from um, a kale plant actually, but just about every vegetable will leave something like this at the end um, of the growing season. And these things don't really compost very well. They're very slow to compost. Um, it's best to kind of bash them up with a mallet or something if you want them to compost. But if you invest in a wood chipper, then you can turn these into um, a delicious meal for your chickens. And I'm just going to demonstrate that to you now because I was so impressed by this when I first realized I could do it. So this is what you're left with at the end of chipping. And you can see my chickens are already frothing at the mouth in anticipation. <laughs> Let's give it to them. And you can see my chickens are absolutely devouring that um, very happily. I'm gonna spread it over the rest of their enclosure now so they have to hunt about for the juicy bits. <laughs> so I've also planted a lot of trees since I moved here. Um, behind me, um, you can see an artificial windbreak, which I've made with posts that I cut myself. But in front of that, there is also um, 70 Western Red Cedar saplings, which will replace that windbreak when they grow up a bit and um, become a bit more substantial. Um, in this area here, there's also um, three apple trees, uh, three cherry trees, two pear trees, all different varieties. Um, and a mirabelle, a plum tree, a damson tree, and a few others that I can't remember. So um, this winter I've been able to plant basically a, a forest garden, a small one in this area. Um, and countless fruit bushes as well, um, blackcurrant, redcurrant, whitecurrant, um, gooseberries, and um, oh gosh, there's so many, there's so many, trust me. Um, and further down at the end of my land, I've planted lots of birch trees in the wet areas because they cope really well with that moisture, just like willow. Um, there's a few hawthorn saplings that I've planted to fill some gaps um, in my hedgerow. So I'm actively planting things as well. Oh, and next winter, I'm going to plant about 10 or 15 um, hazel trees, um, the uh, cultivated variety, which I think are called filberts. Um, which should hopefully give me big hazel crops as well in the coming years. So um, it's all about finding a balance, um, coppicing and planting, um, mixing it all together in the right way for your piece of land. Um, and if you find that right balance, then it is possible to achieve self-sufficiency in a sustainable way, which for me at least is what it's all about. So that's it for this video. <laughs> a huge thank you to everyone for watching as always. You can probably see Moss is transfixed on this stick right now. 
Um, I've had a lot of fun making this one. Trees are a subject very close to my heart, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and take everything with a pinch of salt. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert. I've read a fair bit, so I guess I'm, I'm reasonably well informed. And I've been kind of walking the walk for the last two and a half years. So these techniques work here, at least for me. But if you intend to um, implement any of these strategies on your own land, then do your own research, make your own decisions. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, so thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. One thing I'd really encourage people to look into is rocket mass stoves. Rocket mass stoves, there's tons of videos on YouTube about them. And the reason that they're so fantastic is because they allow you to... And they are completely seasoned and burn really, really hot. Um, and while I'm in here, I want to briefly talk about... Sorry, I was just distracted by moss there as is often the case. So back to coppicing. The other thing, of course, that you're left with um, after you've coppiced a tree, thanks Moss, knocking the camera again, is great big piles of these things, branches, um, or sallies, as my neighbor calls them. Moss, stop it, stop. And it's already beginning to break down. I can see quite a bit of um, decay um, forming on the chips. And that was Moss throwing a stick at me. If any Irish people know why branches are called sallies in Ireland, then please let me know in the comments. Um, but obviously these things, they're too small really to bother with for, for burning. I do tend to take a few bits for, for kindling to start fires with, but 